Okay. Um, um, we, ours is called a Maker Fest because Maker Fair is a copyrighted name and you have to pay a fee to use it, just to let you know that. Um, it's, there's, a, there's a fairly sizable maker community in Richmond. Um, um, they have a hacker space and some shared spaces like that. And the, but the Science Museum is the one that kind of pulled all this together. Um, I got wind of it because I'm a volunteer at the Science Museum. And so they're the ones that put it together. It was a uh, kind of, um, it was a, a new job thing for one of the, one of the new guys, uh, ex-physics teacher at the Science Museum. This was kind of going to get him going. And so, um, so we kind of got involved with it early on. And uh, so that's, that's, how we have, that's how we got going with it. This, so it's, uh, the, the, the numbers for the, for the meetings are, we started in 2014, we had 4,000 people show up. We didn't expect that many, okay? <laughs> it's, a, it's a Saturday from uh, 9 to 5, 4 or 5, four or five something like that, okay? 4,000 people showed up. This young physics teacher who had been, who joined the Science Museum, he was, he was dancing on the moon, man. He couldn't be happier. But we had everything from model railroad layouts to, uh, to um, blacksmiths uh, to, we had a, a, you know these, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what you call them, but these relief things that you can kind of rub with a pencil and get, a, get on paper, get a, they're very popular, they're very popular in England, they do gravestones with, that sort of thing. Well, they had a group that had one of those set up that was the skyline of Richmond. They would put a bed sheet over it and then they'd run a, run a steamroller over it. <laughs> Unfortunately, they were right across the tracks from where we were, so it made things kind of noisy. But this weird variety of, of different things that are done there. So it attracted a lot of people. 2015, there was a uh, tropical storm headed for Richmond. By the way, these are very tough uh, days. There are sep early September, early October, and you have lots of competition. There's going to be at least a dozen other things, many of which are beer fests um, in town, so you get a lot of competition. Anyway, 2015, there was a tropical storm heading for Richmond. Um, everybody decided to close down there. As I see them said, we're going to move everybody indoors. Um, we moved indoors and we had uh, almost 9,000 people show up, okay? And then last year we figured, well, we're going to be down to 3,500, 4,000. In spite of all the competition, we got 7,800. So it's kind of getting a reputation, um, but it's highly varied. Um, good, uh, uh, good, a good turnout, you know, and, and I, our objectives are perhaps a little different from whatever yours are. Ours are to say that ham radio is alive and functioning just fine, thank you, and you'll see some of the ways we do to show that. And oh, by the way, we teach the classes and we give the exams. So if you're interested, come out and see us. And that basically is our exhibit. We're just being we're the public view of ham radio. Um, and we do see some results that are direct from it, and some results we'll sometimes find out a year or so later, oh yeah, I saw you guys first at the Maker Fest. So we don't have a really tight correlation. Uh, if we had an advertising agency, we'd probably hire them for this pro strategy, or fire them for the strategy, but, but it, it's good for us. Anyway, so let's see, how do I change this thing? I guess up here, huh? So this is where it's done. Um, we're bound by one of these train sheds. We're kind of down in a dip. You can imagine the uh, radio reception down there, okay? Um, we, the year that we had the storm, we were in one of these tents down here inside. Um, so that's our location. Um, it's just, now, they really do well by us because we were early into this thing and because we kind of helped them with it. They make sure they place us in a choice location. That's the choice location because down here are the beer trucks and the food trucks. <laughs> and you get a lot of traffic that just happens to be on the way to a beer and oh, isn't that interesting. Okay. May, may I ask a question? Yes. You said better outdoors. Is that for reasons other than reception, 
communication? Yes. Uh, mostly it's for radio communication, but it's all. But, but we don't really do contact with this. I will show you what that's about in a second. But, but um, you get a lot more traffic that way, um, and and particularly being outdoors. Uh, it's I'm, just, I'm not just kidding. Being on the route to the beer trucks and the food trucks is a real advantage. So. Oh, and you have to ask for what you want. So we get two tables. Um, they're about the length of these, but they're twice as wide. So we get two of those. Um, we only need five amps of power. Um, you have to be prepared for the inside. And there are some groups that you know have some problems getting uh, signed up each year because well they won't go inside if something goes wrong. Um, and there is no good loca location for antennas. So, okay. The first thing we had to learn was what hams want to do is make contacts, show how to tune a radio, and demo. What people want to see is making radios, what kind of tools we use to build them with. They want to see some ham homemade radios. They want action visuals. So we have stuff like, this is a bit X40, right? So we have this around for them to look at. This is a, um, and it isn't just ham stuff. We have a VHF. Um, Radio, uh, here it is, airband radio kit. Okay? You know, it's eight, uh, $18 from China, right? So we have this kind of stuff around, and not just ham stuff. We want to get them interested in electronics, building stuff, and if it leads to ham radio, um, that's, that's what we, we'd like to see. And I'll show you the active visuals in a second. So, this is the way our table is arranged. At this end is one of the guys who was going to come here tonight but couldn't because he had a vacation. Um, Ken Zudovin, K4ZUT, and he is usually trying to build something. He doesn't get much built. There are so many questions about where do I get the kits and how do I put it together? And what kind of tools do I need and what can I do with this? And do I need a license for that? No, you don't to receive the air radio. I want to talk to somebody. We need a license for that. Uh, he's just going continuously. And on the other end is our friend John here with an SDR receiver and hooked up to a computer on that display. It just gets a, spec a, spec a uh, spectrum display of whatever it is we can get. You want to tell them what we can get? Well, we didn't get a whole lot when we were out there because the, it was super noisy, the antenna location is not really good. But it does have, the spectrum is something that people aren't used to seeing. The, I mean, a lot of hams know what that is, but a lot of people don't get that. So I spent most of my time explaining to them what was actually happening there. We talked, I talked to them about the uh, radio itself, uh, how much it cost, and the fact that you just need an antenna. In fact, you have one there, I think. That is the one. You have an antenna hooked up to it, and you hook it to your computer. And people were just amazed at that because they thought they had to buy all this expensive stuff to just do that. I would also show them the waterfall display, which was uh, something that they didn't see or understand, and, and just basically went over, you know, what the the radio did and um, how they could could do that also, and kind of get their interest up to possibly get into the ham radio. And <clears throat> the other thing that that does to us is that it says to people, this is not your, your old uncle down in the basement hung over a key with the headphones on, keying away. Ham radio uses computers, it uses receivers of the size, we're experimenting and building with stuff, some of the stuff doesn't work very well, we keep working things out, uh, that sort of thing. So that's the other message we want to put across. And the final message is there are three quarters of a million of us we aren't dying, okay? We're growing at least at the, at the level of the population, maybe slightly more. So we're, we're a going concern. Because that's part of attracting people too. That people aren't gonna join something they think it's, it's my old uncle's thing is it's slowly dying, okay? All right, so that's the two ends of the table. Um, in between we have the kits. So we show things like I got a, we had a pan of ice, and I don't bring my fancy soldering station, but a soldering station and a 
meter, and we have a few other tools around, just to give them a sense of what the tools are that we use to build stuff with. Um, we have one ham who loves to build tube stuff from scratch, so he's got the old chassis punches and the whole bit, okay? Um, we've got a bid X and I don't know what else here. That's an old Heath kit that someone's refurbished. And we, op we make sure the tops are open so people can look at it. And we usually have someone around who could point out what this stuff's all about. Amazing how fascinated people are about what's inside this stuff. The other thing we have in the center is the promotion. We, had a, we have one of our members is an is a industrial designer. Very, very good with designing things that look really great, graphic designer. He designed some beautiful cards for us to use at it that were lovely but didn't seem to communicate very well. So last year we put this dumb little thing out and it just clicks. Who we are, where we meet, when we meet, what we offer, here's our website. And we hand those things out and they we get 500 for... 500 for like 10 bucks. And, this and, yeah. and those things <laughs> fly <laughs> off the table. What those things is, fly off the table. What huh? size is That's a business card. That's a business card. Plain old business card. We actually, the first year we made these trifold type uh, brochures. And I can't say they did any good, but we do have people who've gotten a hold of us because of the business card. The other thing that one of our members did was he looked around on ARRL and found these brochures. And those are better than anything else we've tried. Um, the, um, you can see 22 things you can do with amateur radio. That's a way of clicking on. Um, what is ham radio? Do it yourself stuff. So we have these things. These, that's probably 20 bucks worth of slick double-sided color brochures from ARL. Actually, if you're a club, you get them for free. Okay. They just charge you a flat rate $10 shipping. Okay. Is this special service clubs or that's any club? I think any club could get it. I don't know. I'm just curious. That could be it. But, but those things move off the table pretty well, too. We don't have any spares. We're done. So uh, that, that's working. Have you ever considered <coughs> downloading the DIY video? about seven or eight minutes and appeals to young people. We ran it one time at our maker fair on a small monitor and it attracted some attention. We haven't tried that. Um, we People really do kind of pass through fairly quickly. This is the guy who's down at the end of the table building stuff, Ken's thing. This is his maker setup. Um, we do have a big uh, banner, a six foot long, two foot wide banner that we hang up on the rafters for the club. Um, he took into putting a tablecloth on, so we go out, and he goes out to dollar store and buys a sheet, black sheet. Um, you saw the, the computer display. We're going to be probably go to a larger um, TV set with an HDMI thing, 32 inches, something like that. Um, he wants to put in a sound system. We're going to have a little fight over that one because they don't, the science user doesn't really want that. It's noisy enough as a bit. They don't want people in there blasting out all the other places. We do need something a little better so that because when, we, we, when you were picking up signals with yours, people couldn't hear it. So we need something a little bit better. Oh, by the way, if you have a problem with you can't pick up any signals, and you know, the, you know how with HF bands are. Um, fortunately, these little things tune all the way up to the VHF. So you tune her up there to, uh, to a simplex frequency in VHF and have somebody key there. They're HT, they get the, the, they get the nice spectral display and he can talk to them about it. That works very well. I mean, that's all you're trying to do is get them to see it. Now, if you can pick up some CW and have them see that sort of thing, that's good, but sometimes you can't. Uh, it's been important for us to sit behind the table looking at them or standing around talking to them. Um, there's a tendency, again, for hams to hunch over you know, their stuff. In fact, we're trying to work out for, for John this year how to, I think we're going to try and make rearrangements so that he is facing out more. It was tough for him to do that. Right. Because they were kind of looking over my shoulder. Yeah. And that, that, that it, we had stuff set up. It worked, for, it worked it well worked enough, right. but, you know, we think that's better. Uh, the literature we talked about, uh, the projects. We do have a, a small subgroup of our club that includes the people who are part of the club called the Build Group, and we get together 
about once a month and usually we're dealing with some common thing we're working on or the other uh, last club meeting we had we a bunch of us got those BD, uh, bid x 40s and we wanted to get them aligned and tuned and most of us don't have all the test equipment we need for that so we kind of assembled at the workshop with with uh, every, you know, oscilloscope from here and a, something, a generator from there. We kind of put them all together and ran through them all to do it. And that could be attractive to new people who are coming in. Solder station. We thought about setting up soldering. With the Boy Scouts, we'd done a, a, a soldering thing, and they loved to solder and unsolder. But there was another group that got ahead of us. I don't know what group that is. You remember the one that has the soldering over yeah, the side? I'm not sure what they were doing. They got, you know, three tables full of soldering irons. We figured, okay, they got that one, we're done. But that's very attractive to young kids. And if you decide to go that way, we did it with the Boy Scouts. Uh, you do need safety goggles. Um, and uh, you need a lot of people hovering over them. But if you do that, what we found is you need to get a bunch of old PC boards that nobody wants and let them unsolder. They love to take them apart. And I was thinking when I was a young kid, I like to take things apart too, so it makes sense. Okay. This is the danger of building a hot solder in order to do it. Yeah. The danger attracts the people. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Particularly boys. I do a demo at the museum. It's a, a chemistry demo and and one of the you know, I'm going around um, I want a, I want an audience when I do it. You can't be a star without an audience, so uh, we go around the I and the other guy do it, we go around with our rubber aprons on and everything else and we'll We'll see a group up there and we'll say, well, we're going to be doing uh, 11 o'clock, we're going to be doing the chemistry demo. And I'll look at the boys and say, and we catch things on fire. The eyes light up and they show up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Active solder, is that going to influence insurance rates of any sort? No. Um, there's a group there that, that we're not going to do it because somebody's already doing it. No, I understand. Uh, no, I mean, you, it, it's. Um, you, you, it requires fairly close, close observation. You do want to make sure you have safety glasses for them. Um, and, you know, but we have not had much problem with it, even with the, with the scout type kids. You've got to watch out for the little tiny kids. You've got to keep them away. But, uh, so they require a bit more supervision. <coughs> Two years in a row we brought <coughs> code practice, off, practice oscillators because we uh, have done both with the Boy Scouts and with a space station contact class we did, we, uh, we brought in um, code practice oscillators and the kids went crazy with them. No one touches them for some reason at this. We've had them every year and I think we're going to bother this year, just too much trouble. No, the only people who ever get with them is we'll get a couple of hams who show up and sit across each other and send code, but nobody else gets to use them. All right, um, and, and we usually have a list of where to get some of these little kits. Okay. Mostly we. Go ahead. Have you ever done anything? I mean, I, I was a scout leader in Alaska for quite a long time. One of the one of the successes we had was that scouts loved building crystal radio kits. Just the old AM cat whisker kits. They had a ball with that. And Difficulty. Had, any, had a crystal radio. What fascinated them the most was it required no obvious power. And that, that that's what that's actually what hooked them. I mean, they're like, where do you plug this in? But you need a very long antenna, and you need a really good ground. Right. Yeah. And that was the problem. We tried that. We did the space station contact. Oh, yeah. We built that, and we just, you know, we couldn't get a good enough ground was our biggest problem. Right. Okay, we're inside a classroom at a building. That's true. We always had that so, uh, <coughs> so, so we, we, that, was a, that was a bomb, so we don't bother with that. Oh. But, but, you know, this sort of thing with a computer is amazingly interesting. When, when, they, when John talks about the, place he, the things he could tune, and what, what's the tuning rate of this thing? Yeah, I, I believe it goes up to 2 gig, isn't it? Yeah, but I'm not sure how it goes down to HF, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you could, uh, I believe, believe you could even, I think you could even pick up uh, the local stations I thought. I know you can pick up the FM stations. Yeah, and then you run one of the SDR pieces of software. Yeah. And it'll do it'll do the waterfall display, it'll do it can do filtering on it and I may have a picture of it down here. Um the people are really just fa I guess fascinated by that. That is what the sharper I think you said it was a sharp. 
Could be. We've got several of them that we've used. This is... <laughs> well, I don't think it really has a brand name on it. Yeah. But it's a it's an eighty twenty T two, which is a fairly common chip. It's a it's a chip made by a particular company. It's actually designed for European digital television. That's what it was designed for. And a ham in Sweden discovered that the way the chip was built, you go in there and change the uh, um, the, the heterodyning frequencies, and therefore change what you tuned. I think the chip manufacturer is real tech. Real tech, you're right. You got it. That's right. Yeah, people really liked, I, I guess it's because of display and something they haven't seen before, but people really were attracted to, I mean, I spent most of the day just mainly talking to people about it and trying to tune around a little bit on it. And, and like Bruce said, people like those cabinets that are open. You can see all the stuff in it because a lot of these people have no idea what's in these things or even what some of the stuff is. And you can, you know, they will like, well, what is that doing? What is this? So things like it, the visual things are really did attract a lot of people. Oh, let's see. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So staffing is an interesting sort of thing because, you know, operating, we have one guy who, I'm thinking about Malin, who operates CW on a 10 watt unit with solar power, with wires in the trees in the back of his house. We call him the He-Man Ham, right? Now we deal with everybody else who's not. And, but a lot of these guys want to operate. They want to make contacts. And Maker Fest is not the place to do it. So we look for a lot of what we call, I call builder explainers. These are the guys who build stuff and also explain it, right? And that's mostly the build group. Then we look for some out, so we, we got to set up an antenna. We got to set up the whole thing up. So we, guys that are good at field day and kind of set up like that. Okay. Then we have our man with the SDR and, the, and, and that sort of thing going. And then mostly uh, knowledgeable, friendly hams. We tend to all wear one color of shirt. We went for white, I guess, the past couple of years. Almost everybody has a white shirt like this. Um, we, we have a sign-up sheet two hours at a time. And we try and set up There's so much to see because there's, I don't know how many thousand square feet of exhibits there are in this thing. It's a lot. We got robot, robot, two robotics groups, you name it. So we set it up so that like Ken works for two hours here, and then he's got this time to wander around on his own, get lunch and come back for another one. So and we usually have enough people kind of volunteer one, two, and three, and then we have a lot of folks at the club who show up anyway without signing up ahead of time. So we're usually well staffed. And then we make up these name badges. We use, we like these, uh, they're a name badge, it's almost like cloth. They're a paper name badge, but they're really flexible like cloth. And they don't fall apart. We keep them simple, name, call sign, the club, that's it. You just print them off yourself? Yeah. You yeah, because, because, because you, it, you know, you're sometimes running towards the end. In fact, sometimes I will find, you know, the evening before I finally have the full list everybody who's going to be there, so I have to kind of finish him off at that point. I'll tell you, you do get kind of sucked into this thing. I was there like the whole day. Yeah. Because <laughs> you start working on it, and then, you know, next thing you know, it's like the day's over with. Well, you know, I start off like this. I got a couple of hours off here, and I about four hours off here, and I want around and see the other displays, talk to the other people, and I'm back on again. And that works out pretty well. And as I say, not very far from where we are is the beer truck and the beer trucks and the uh, food trucks. So you, you're not going to go too far wrong. Um, we tried a lot of different things for themes. And the thing that seems to work for us, we think, I think this last year worked the best, is license to transmit. And I think we're going to get a prettier version of this put out. Um, what, we, what we found was that was, the, that was the thing people could connect with. And then you get into conversations about, OK, you got this two-way radio, and people have the FRS radios. How is this different? So you can get that conversation started. What's the advantage of having a ham radio versus having one of these? Um, and we did some pictures, which I hope we clean up some more, to show a few items that, that hams do, not a whole lot. 
but just to give a little sense of variety. We had done an ISS contact last year, so we kind of emphasized that. We probably won't do it again this year. Um, and then we have these pieces of paper that go into some uh, several things that are of interest that you can look at in ham radio. And we have little QR codes on here, so you can take your phone, click on it, and go to that website and follow it up. Quick ways to follow things up. Then Ken, who's always trying new things, put together this code thing. And I thought, well, OK, I'm going to hang it up, but it ain't going to go anywhere. It was a surprising uh, conversation starter. Uh, people would say, well, do you have to know code to get a license? No, it's things people like to do. Oh, well, gee. And so you'd get a conversation started around code, which I didn't expect. So we're going to use it again this year. Yeah. Uh, OK, this is, do you know, some of you are old enough to remember Karnak. <laughs> um, here's the answer. What's the question? All right, so the first one I kind of gave away. What's the question? Code, right. Um, this is part of the why would you go with one of these as opposed to an FRS radio, okay? So that's part of answering that. Um, we, um, we teach the classes, we give the FCC exams. What's the Richmond Amateur Radio Club? Um, this is the way we, we characterize the licenses, okay? Well, that's, I mean, there are a few people who need the extra spectrum of, 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 of uh, extra, but mostly it's bragging rights. I was the general just long enough to realize that every single good conversation was out of my area. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to drop down another six kilohertz to get a good rank sheet going or something. Yeah. Well, that's true, particularly with the Europeans, because they only yeah. have two licenses. Well, I lived in Alaska so. at the time, and it was frustrating. Yep. Because, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, though, you know, I don't have a working HF antenna right now. Neither does John. We, we have probably. No, and, okay. Well, we have come. Well, we we actually have we actually have gone out and built a uh, a remotely controlled station for the for the club. So now I can get on my tablet or that sort of thing and get on that way. Um, anyway, um, question is, what's it cost to get in the ham radio? Those are the two answers. <laughs> Obviously, tech. <laughs> right. Um, the other thing that's worth talking about if people come up with it is to talk about the level of community that's involved in ham radio. Um, and the fact that it's actually worldwide. If you meet a ham in, in, uh, in Italy and you identify as hams, the most likely you're going to connect. In fact, you'll probably get a bottle of wine and a good meal out of it. So, you know, it's that kind of connection. Um, the other thing is that we have a tendency to give each other technical advice. The build group gets together with all their test gear. We got some guys who'll get together to work on your antenna with you. Um, some will run over with an antenna analyzer, that sort of thing. And then we talk a little bit about this backup communication, which interests some people as well. Can I assume, Bruce, you can send Larry a copy of this PowerPoint? Yeah, if he's got a thumb drive with him, we'll give it a copy of him now. I've got it as a PDF, which is probably the easier way to have it. That's true, a small All right, so this is a little group of last, you know, last year's sort of thing. They, the trolley is now gone. They donated to some other group. Really? Yeah. You, the trolley used to actually run in there. This is, a, this is an old Richmond trolley. It's one of the ones that didn't, didn't burn after the Second World War. And you can see John here. This is what we, I think what we're going to do this year is we're going to set this up with a laptop so he can turn around and see the display in the laptop, talk to them, and they can see the bigger display. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, you know, every year we learn a little something else about it. Um, so, but, but we're, okay, the, the Maker Fest, sponsored by the Science Museum, um, there's a maker group of collections of makers who put this together. Um, some people are selling things there that they make, artisan work. Um, people are just, people are showing ho hobby work. 
Um, there's a, there are two hacker spaces, maker spaces that are part of this. So it's a fairly large deal. Um, and of course, Richmond's a bigger, <coughs> bigger town than this one is. If it, we, did a, we did a little article in uh, QST last fall, I guess. Yeah. And the, the, the big article was on the, on the one in the Bay Area. We, have, we had our high point was 8,900 visitors. They run over three days and had 430,000. So it's a completely different scale. But anyway, so this is, uh, this is kind of our maker fest sort of thing. I don't know what, what this. So somebody comes up to you and says, yeah, this looks interesting. I don't know anything. What kind of kit could I build? OK. Well, what are you interested in hearing? Because there are a couple of things you can do. If you like to listen to airplanes, we have the air band kit. Okay. okay. And, and that is suitable for a first time fit builder. Well, we'll talk about that a bit. How are you good at you at, are you good at soldering? Okay. Um, so we kind of get into that conversation. It ends up being a conversation in almost all cases. Okay. Um, we could talk about if you just want to listen. Okay. And we'll and we've got some information on the couple of three different SDR pieces of software you can use. We talk about antennas a bit. So most of these are dialogues. There isn't a simple answer. There's usually, if, if, if I don't know the answer, I may go to John and say, you know, can you tell him about that, so forth. So you have examples of several different levels of kits. Yes. Well, the BIDX, for, the BIDX for example, if you know the BIDX 40, it's, it's mostly assembled. In terms of the printed circuit board, what you're doing is putting the rest of the gear on. Okay, so that's one possibility. Um, this is clearly doing things with the computer to listen to stuff. Um, this is building a fairly simple kit. You got to have soldering skills, but none of this is is a surface mount. So we show a bunch of different things that you might want to do, even things like building your own clock. Okay, so. What's your interest? Do you want to get involved in this? <coughs> Anything else you can think of to ask? Is the dongle, what does the dongle cost? Oh, I think it somewhere between twenty-five and thirty-five dollars. Yeah. What's yeah. the date of the next one? Um, it's in October, <coughs> and I'm not sure the exact weekend has been nailed down yet. Let me take a quick look. Um, you have to apply for it every year. And I'm trying to think if they have yeah, actually. Bruce mentioned that the uh, club has a remote station too. So if you get somebody that just got their license and doesn't have any equipment, if they have a computer and they're a member of the club, then they have access to equipment. And we have it. We're using the uh, uh, remote mm -hmm. ham software package. And what you do is you load up all the call signs of all the people who could check in. Okay with their license class. So the software will actually not let a, a tech go on a, a tune on HF. He can listen, but he can't tune or transmit on HF. So, but we're having antenna problems with it. Yes? How did you keep a record of the number of people visiting your booth? Oh, no, no. That's not the number of visiting my booth. That's the number going to the Science Museum. Oh, thank you. I don't keep that number. In fact, the Science Museum has a hard time keeping it because mm -hmm. Well, usually they have one entrance, but for this, they open things up. <clears throat> the Science Museum, a busy day at the Science Museum is 1,000 people a day, okay? When you have that many people coming in, you can't, you can't focus on the one entrance, so they have several mm -hmm. entrances going. So they try and hand out little tickets for people to, to take, and then they keep account of how many they get handed out, kind of like your little reel there. So, yes? One of the problems that we faced at one of our maker fairs, I think it was the year before last, was that the organization putting it on had a pretty hefty charge uh, to people coming in. I think it was $8 or something for... This is, this is free. Yeah, okay. It's free because the makers want it free. See, just as this is an introduction to ham radio for us, it's an introduction to the Science Museum for some people. So they get to go through, through the exhibits of the Science Museum, they get to wander around and see all the stuff. And the Science Museum hopes they're going to come back. And it's like us. There's no way of proving for sure they're going to come back. But, but it certainly is a good introduction for them. Yes? 
Bruce, you uh, were talking about uh, the interest in Morse code, uh, CW, as an attraction. And what we have is our illustrious uh, Hollywood star over here, K4BAB, uh, who dresses up as a world, a Civil War uh, telegrapher, and uh, he will actually be showing them, demonstrating Morse code, and also allowing them to uh, tap out their, their names. And it is a big attraction. And it's That's good. That it's certainly... Uh, so I commend you to try that out, too. At your point. We might have a problem with table space, but we'll go for three tables this year. <laughs> no. um, but, yes? I was just going to ask, if you, do, you have a, do you have a spot on your website for maker attendees to go after they leave? Uh, you might want to consider you know, whatever your URL is to your, to your home page, you know, like slash maker or something like that, where... Uh, when they go to leave or when they're there, you can, you can share that with them either on their electronic, you know, on their phone or whatever. Well, we uh, have, have that. We, what we have is, uh, let me find it. These little things right here right. will take you to the, to the class schedules, the class description. Right. That, that's for the science museum, but I, I was thinking more for your... Radio yeah, this is this is a this oh, is the club. Yeah. Oh, oh. So if you if you click your phone here, oh, it'll good. take you to the place on our website that gives you the uh, class schedules, the place that gives you the class oh, descriptions. Oh, okay. I missed that. Yeah. I that right. Okay. So no, this is this is this is all our stuff. You know, that's something we might want to think about for field day. Mm -hmm. Like people are come to our field day, we can I can set up a code for that. Uh, so people can just use their portable device go right to the well, it's, it's, it's real easy. We go to our website, I copy the URL out, yeah, pop it into one of these yeah. generators and pop it on yeah, a piece I, of paper. I do that all the time. So yep. Let's make sure of that. Bruce, you, you feel like you get a significant percentage of your uh, the people that take your class from this maker fair, right? No. Are we, we... I'll tell you what brings people to the class, I'm convinced. We teach it um, in September and March of every year consistently. Now, you don't have to teach it twice a year, but it's a consistent sort of thing. And I think after a while, people get to the point where they know, oh, yeah, these guys are going to teach it. Now, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the going to teach it this year. My kids live in Charlotte, an amazingly large town, but they are on again, off again with their classes. This year they may have a bunch of classes and then they may not have any for a couple of years. So people kind of don't know where to go. So it's this consistency, I think, that makes the difference. But you're not looking for new members so much as you're trying to expose the public to amateur radio. And, but new members would be great. We'd yeah, love to have you take the classes sure. as well. And we, we get a sense that people do. We, we'll get students, they'll talk about having seen us at the Maker Fest. So, we do know that we have some effect. We know we get some upgrades because of that. Some hams come by. Maybe they got a license they haven't messed with in a long time. They got the juices going again, and they come and study for general or something. So, you know. And we get the other thing, we get a lot of phone calls from people finding on, things on, our, on the website. They'll go out and look for ham radio in, in Richmond, and they'll see the club come up. And, and then they go out to our space, and we give them a, I, a, a, an email and a phone number. I, I must talk to uh, three or four people a month who will call wanting to take, you know, more, more about taking classes, so. And we're certainly ha happy to, you know, share with you all if you're looking at taking, uh, teaching more classes, some of the ways you put it together. We've been doing it, I don't know how long we've been doing it. Do you, John? No. Somewhere in the 70s. And, um, and very consistently, I don't know. I, I mean, I, that's how I learned it, and I got my license in '91. So you know. I learned it through a club. Yeah. Good. How many people come to your meetings typically? Thirty or forty? Yeah. Depends. Yeah. On yeah. 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 Depends on what is being taught. Yeah. Sometimes we'll have twenty, and sometimes we'll fill a place. We've got uh, 120, 130 members. Got six clubs in Richmond. The two big ones are Richmond Amateur Radio Club and and rats. Anything else?
Okay. Well, thank you. You can take a look at some of the stuff that we uh, show out here. We won't run out of it right, right off. Well, we may do some playing around with DMR this time. That's been kind of interesting to me. I'm, I'm not so sure I was crazy about doing this digital stuff over the internet until I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was pretty nice. All right.